sobre trucos de la revisión del componente femoral. Cuando quiera. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organizers for organizing a, a great event and for looking after us. Are we ready with the slides? Uh, here we go. So I'm going to talk about trying to get the components out and do minimum damage. Our aims, the important one is maintaining bone stock, but also the soft tissue attachments as well. And thinking when you're taking it out about the biomechanics when you're putting it back in again, and always maintaining function. The first thing to think of is, do we really need to revise the stem? Uh, Professor Gerke earlier showed a case where there was a stem that was lower. He was able to save by putting on a big head. Uh, there's some similar examples here. If you've got secondary stability, it can be worth thinking about, certainly with uncemented stems. <clears throat> At the other end of the spectrum, sometimes the revision looks so horrible that you don't want to do it in any circumstances. And if you can find a way of getting out of doing a revision like this, then maybe it will be safer. So in this one, we thought we'd save the stem and we just put an implant onto the bottom of the stem and created a, a total femoral replacement, um, which was for an 88-year-old lady a bit kinder. The next thing I think we should think about is which approach saves the most. Uh, when you're trying to choose between a trochanteric osteotomy uh, or even a transfemoral approach, you have to think if you're going to smash that proximal bone to pieces with no control, it's going to be worse. <clears throat> this is an example of a metallosis uh, case that had then been revised. Uh, they hadn't realized the damage was already done. The bone was dead. None of the soft tissues were attached still to the femur. So it is better to do a transfemoral approach, get rid of this and start again. Uh, and it looks drastic and unpleasant, uh, but I believe it did less damage. So if we do decide we're going to do an extended trochanteric osteotomy, what are the reasons to do it? You're looking for proper access to the femoral canal. Uh, you're doing an extended trochanteric osteotomy rather than the, the Charnley type osteotomies because you want a high bone surface area and an increase in union rates. These are not primary cases. They're not going to have success with little flips and small osteotomies. You're maintaining a longer soft tissue attachment, and that's increasing the vascularity of the fragment, part of the reason that it's going to heal well, hopefully. And then there is versatility. You can change the length <clears throat> as much as you want. So how to try and do it right? It's simple. I think most people know, but I'll put the pictures up. So start off with a good exposure. Make sure you can see the bone you want to perform the osteotomy on. Release the gluteus maximus and take the vastus lateralis off under the periosteum and bring it anteriorly so you can actually see proper bare bone. Then I move on to some drill holes from the base of the trochanter just in front of the linear aspera coming down to the length that you've templated that you want your uh, trochanteric osteotomy to and then coming across uh, straight as well. And then we connect these holes with a small oscillating saw and then insert two or three osteotomes across the length of the osteotomy and then just slowly use those to lever it outwards. It doesn't take a lot of force and lever on all three of the osteotomes together uh, so there's not too much force in any one area. Uh, it's as simple as that. If this is not the right place for you, if you want to do an anterolateral osteotomy, this can be very useful if you have a very long bowed uh, femur, a long revision stem, and if you're purely lateral, you would not get round the bow. So it's a similar approach, but you just move it more anteriorly. In this case, we can make a split through the vastus lateralis muscle and come down through there. Uh, certainly, if you're looking at an osteotomy over around uh, 20 centimeters, I would prefer an anterolateral uh, ETO. Uh, tips in terms of the sizing of it, I would aim for the fragment to be about one third of the diameter. Any less than that, and there is a risk that the fragment will fracture. Any more than that, and you're disturbing that intact tube uh, that's left behind. The usual length is around at 12 to 18 centimeters, but you will plan that based on the implant that's going in and the implant that's coming out. And it's very important that the osteotomies are right through to the implant or the cement uh, before you then try and do that levering technique. Otherwise, you'll end up with an incomplete fracture somewhere and you'll end up with the osteotomy disappearing off in the wrong direction. 
If the bone is weak, you can pass a cable around two centimetres below the osteotomy, which provides some uh, resistance to the hoop stresses at this level. Uh, if there's a sudden change in the profile of the implant, uh, this furlong is a classic. Bring the osteotomy to below the level there, so you have got the, uh, behind the bulk of the, of the big proximal part. And similarly, if you've got an area where there's a change uh, in angle, bring the ostomy out at the uh, angle at apex of the deformity. Uh, if you're putting a modular uncemented stem back in again, you can have flexibility on the order. The order I normally use, I do the osteotomy, remove the implants, I then prepare and place the distal stem like this when you can see it nicely without the osteotomy closed, then close the osteotomy around it, then put the trial and put the proximal body on after that. I think that gives you the maximum access with the minimum damage. If you're using a two-stage approach, I would suggest a proper preformed spacer is better with an extended trochanteric osteotomy. Uh, the, uh, the, the use of uh, burgers and sticks of uh, cement are not rigid enough, and it also gives a good thing to wire the osteotomy back around. Uh, you have to remember that if you have done an ETO, there is loss of one of the potential three points of fixation. So fixation becomes harder. And if you've got something like this where you've lost the medial support as well, fixation is just distal, it's dangerous, and you can have fractures even with very tough implants like the link. Failures of the ETO with revisions, non-union rates are higher, so 5 to 10% failures. Trochanteric fractures, 10 to 15%, and needs for revision of trochanteric surgery, excluding even removal of metalwork, are up to about 5%. So if you're going to try and avoid that, you need to start with a plan. You need to get the right kit in. You start from the top and move down to the bottom. And if it's not working, you have to admit there is a problem and move back to the ETO approach. You need some good extractors. If there's a known ex uh, device that you're taking out, many of them will have some sort of implant-specific extractor. This is the link handle which can attach straight back on, for example. If not, there are some universal systems that can work well. may not be brilliant for well-fixed, uncemented cases, uh, but it's worth a try. If it's well fixed and cemented, you need to take the cement out from above this area here before you move on, and then often you can get it out with a, a universal loop extractor at this point. Uh, if not, then you work sequentially down with chisels and gouges, and once the implant is out, you can use splitters and curettes uh, to get that cement out uh, in a primary case. In revision cases, or if the, if the distal plug is very well fixed, uh, then you're going to have to use something more than that. So normally I will use an Oscar or UltraDrive ultrasonic device to burn through. I think this is better than flexible reamers because they bounce off areas of cement that are left stuck to the side and you can't see them. I quite often use a knee uh, arthroscope and have used that to have a direct look down if we're keeping the canal intact. It gives you a great view and you can find where you are related to the plug. Uh, if you have got problems with the shape of the bone, so holes and splits, an x-ray is very important so you don't get stuck in there. Uh, and often I just use simple rakes like this. Uh, if we get through the plug, we can rake backwards and bring the rest of the cement back upwards. If you've got a, a cement mantle that is intact but is loose but you still can't get it out, if you put a threaded conical tap into it and give it a couple of quite sharp turns, it will engage in and then you can slap it back out and um, your trainees look very pleased and impressed if you bring out the whole piece in one. Uh, it makes you smile behind your surgical mask. Uh, if this isn't working, then you need to move on to specific extraction kits. You need some flexible osteotomes, and you need different shapes. So you need straight ones for the front and back of the prosthesis, some radial-shaped ones for the outside border, and some curved ones for the inside border. I also use some 2 millimeter uh, wires, K-wires, with some drivers, and extractors and slap hammers can be very useful. Uh, having access to a high-speed metal cutter is important in some cases as well, and I would like to make sure that with all my revisions there is one available. Look at the radiographs and see what you're trying to take out and define the shape of it and measure uh, exactly where you've got to get up to. Starting off, as I said, often I'll use a, a K-wire uh, technique and just move down, uh, and the flexibility of the K-wire means it will follow the stem and it will sit in that gap between the stem and the cortex. Uh, if you get most of it out and you're feeling quite confident, particularly in a proximally coated stem, 
If you can knock it down one or two millimetres, then it's evidence that it is not bonded and it should be able to get out. Uh, Well-fixed, proximally coated stems. If you see this area of bonding here, typical in an ABG2 stem, uh, you can see it's just bonded in one place and we can use a limited slot femorotomy where we make a little cut here at the site of bonding templated on the x-ray. We can put an osteotome in the cut and then if we wiggle the osteotome from side to side, it debonds very well. This works for ABG2s and works quite well for Karai stems as well. Modular neck prostheses are horrible to remove, sorry. Um, there, there are systems that get them out. The rejuvenate one from Stryker is the best one, uh, but unfortunately it's not uncommon to need osteotomy. If you're trying to avoid an osteotomy, there are some tricks you can do. We can make a little window and then we can use our high-speed cutter. We can section the proximal piece off. We can take this out and then we can use a reamer to take the distal part out separately. Uh, this is getting hard work and maybe more often than not, we do an osteotomy for this one. So pros, an extensive exposure with, of the acetabulum and the femoral canal with the osteotomy. You're in control of where that fracture uh, happens, and you can move the trochanter around when you fix it back on again. Cons, you do need bone union. Uh, there may be problems with uh, trochanteric escape. You're definitely weakening the proximal bone stock as well. If you're putting a cemented implant back in, it's hard to stop cement going into the osteotomy. And you'll need to put wires uh, in and around as well. Thank you. Thank you.